Good afternoon, and welcome to our panel, Smart Asses, The Harvard Lampoon in Hollywood. I didn't think of that title. Uh, but I was a Lampoon uh, graduate myself, as was our moderator. Lawrence O'Donnell graduated from the Lampoon in 1974. And as any devotee of his Wikipedia entry knows, uh, Lawrence started his career as an aide to US Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and he was staff director for the Senate Finance Committee. He wrote for the West Wing, he acted in Big Love, and he's currently the host of MSNBC's The Last Word. Eric Erickson hates him, which is one more reason why I consider Lawrence a national treasure. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lawrence O'Donnell. You know, I, I, we're starting late, and so we're trying to do everything a little quicker, but the thing I don't get is, um, in my introduction, how long does it take to say Emmy winner? How long, it's like, it's like, I mean, no, no, look, Emmy winner, it's like that, you know? And um, I don't know, maybe it was a time thing, okay. Um, we are going to introduce the panel as is the show business tradition, in descending order of Emmy wins. <laughs> okay? Which means we have to start with Al Jean. Tonight's show with Johnny Carson, writer, okay? Show of hands, who's Johnny Carson? Anybody know? Okay. Um, also the Gary Shandling Show, and then for the majority of his adulthood at The Simpsons, and Al Jean didn't bring them with him today, but he has eight Emmys, and he's coming up to the stage right now. <laughs> Greg Daniels. Uh, you know his work uh, from uh, The Office, which he, he created the American version of that. Uh, Parks and Recreation, uh, King of the Hill, uh, created all those things. Uh, they wouldn't, those shows wouldn't exist without him, so you can thank him for those. He's also a Simpsons graduate, Saturday Night Live graduate, as so many uh, Harvard Lampoon people are. Uh, but he began on a more obscure show uh, that I think we might talk about at the very beginning of this, and he can tell us about it there. Uh, Greg's got five Emmys. <laughs> and our last and uh, tallest guest uh, spent... Uh, some of his formative years at The Simpsons, at Saturday Night Live, and uh, you know him as the tallest West Coast late night talk show host. <laughs> He's got three Emmys, Conan O'Brien. There you are. Um, I, uh, you know, I don't work Sundays, so I've prepared nothing. The good news is we're going to rely on you guys uh, for the questions as I kind of sit back here as a, as a spectator. Uh, but I know that, you know, there's this image that the Harvard Lampoon has taken over show business. It began with the empty seat. Uh, some of you may know that Jim Downey was announced as being on this panel. Uh, we left the seat empty because the, the likelihood of Jim Downey showing up for this was never more than 1%. And that's, that, but that's true of everything he does, you know. And, and so none of us believed he was going to be here. Uh, and, uh, but he was the first of the Harvard Lampoon guys to go to Saturday Night Live in what I believe was its second season, somewhere around 76 or 77, somewhere in there. And you can do a pyramid, as one magazine once did, with all of these headshots and names of all of these people who followed him into show business, I think most of whom would have gone anyway, but he was the pioneer. And uh, 
and Conan, um, what what did Jim's trailblazing mean to you? Did it did it show you a path that you didn't know was there, or were you going to go find that path on your own anyway? Uh, I think that I had pretty much backed myself into a corner by the end of senior year that I was going to be an entertainer or somehow get into the business. I didn't your know how. Your transcript reflects that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I mean, I was actually uh, I, I was a good student, a hard worker, but. I decided to go all in uh, pretty quickly after getting on the Lampoon. So I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I remembered thinking, it's, it's not going to be medical school. It's not going to be law school. Uh, the male modeling is not going to happen. Uh, and it's going to be uh, definitely uh, me being in show business. I have to do this. So the fact that there were people that I had met I had met Jim Downey briefly. Some of these grads would come back. I had met Al Jean and Mike Reese, his writing partner, and they had jobs that was intriguing to me. I remember thinking, how can you, how can that be a living? You can get paid to do this? And I had, I knew nobody in show business, but I knew that this was a possibility. And then people before me, Jeff Martin, who's here, sitting in the front row. Jeff Martin, give him, there he is right there. Mr. Jeff Martin, ladies and gentlemen. Jeff Martin went out to Los Angeles, uh, it went to New York and worked for David Letterman, and I remember thinking that was like knowing somebody who had joined the Beatles, and uh, that was just an extraordinary, and so I knew people, and because I knew people and I knew it could be done, it gave me a little bit of the courage to try. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's why no doctors came from my neighborhood. None of us knew a doctor. We'd never seen that as an occupational model. Uh, but. You know, I know there's an image out there that it's easy for these Harvard Lampoon guys. There's just this, you know, freeway right into show business, and they make it in easily. I'm going to tell a quick anecdote uh, and then ask you guys to either confirm or deny how easy it was. But uh, Jim Downey was running the Letterman writing staff at a certain point, and Dave looked up one day and realized uh, pretty much, uh, you know, nine out of ten of these writers are from this one little building in Cambridge, the Harvard Lampoon. And he said, you know, the next one is an opening. It can't be Harvard Lampoon. It can't be Harvard Lampoon. At this point, Sandy Frank, who we know, uh, was a, had gone to Harvard Law School. He was a board lawyer working in Midtown across the street from the guys having fun at SNL and, and Letterman. And Sandy wrote a submission for Letterman. And it was presented to Dave, no, no names on the, on the submissions, no trace of where it came from. And Dave said, oh, I, I, I want that one. And Jim's problem was he's picked the Harvard Lampoon guy again, uh, Sandy Frank. And so... Uh, kind of an anecdote is yeah, that. I mean, well, well really? no, the, 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 the the, the, that that they were going... Like at that Harvard, point, yeah. at that point, it was a strike against you on that show, a hurdle you had to get over. At yes, that people should stop right. discriminating against us white people from Harvard, right. I think is what you're saying. There's Enough! A Give a white male from Harvard a freaking chance. Is what we're here to say. That movie, 12 years a Harvard Lampoon graduate, it's really sad. It's yeah. <laughs> but, but Al, what was your experience getting in the business? He just sailed right, right just like the rest of us. No trials or tribulations. We've never <laughs> experienced pain of any kind. Well, goodbye. Good luck to all of you. We'll just levitate out of our seats. And yeah. <laughs> we live in an ice palace together. No, I, um, uh, the, the biggest thing in our careers was uh, two other great writers from the Lampoon, Tom Gamble and Max Bross. Uh, everybody loved them, and they kept getting opportunities, too many for them to handle, and we would take what they turned down. So they were offered a chance to work on the movie Airplane 2, which is the bad one, um, and they turned it down, but we took it, Mike and I. And then, um, uh, not necessarily the news wanted them, but they were busy, and then The Simpsons, and uh, they turned it down, and we took it, and now they work for me, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> that was the answer. Uh, Greg, you got started with Conan, didn't you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there was Tom and Max, and there was Mike and Al, and I think Conan looked around and saw that he needed some beard to come out as a team <laughs> with, get in the business, and uh, uh, he, he plucked me, um, and we came out in uh, 85, I guess, and uh, I was just saying to Al that, uh, we ended up working on not necessarily the news uh, just as he left. I think we took his, he and Mike's spot when they went to the Tonight Show. And I got Al's desk, which 
was filled with uh, a weird assortment of vitamins and earthquake awareness pamphlets and <laughs> things like that. It was a warning. And I didn't, I didn't know who he was. That was my only introduction to him. I was like... <laughs> and we, uh, Greg and I came out here in, in August of 85. I, had, I, had, I don't know if you had been to Los... I had never been to Los Angeles. I was from Boston. I had gone to school in Boston. We took uh, a crappy flight. We, we had no money, so we took a, a red eye or some kind of flight that delivered us at a horrible time uh, early in the morning to Los Angeles, and Greg couldn't sleep, so he, he, we were jammed in together, and he put uh, a blanket over his head and rocked from side to side <laughs> to try and get himself to sleep. Um, we're trying you, to make our story sound difficult. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> see, was, we had a hard flight. It was a we difficult flight, is what a, I'm saying. It was coach. It, it was, was one of the early production Learjets. <laughs> Not as comfortable a private plane as I've become accustomed to. I took a private plane from Brentwood to be here today. It has the Lampoon insignia on the back. And it shoots rain fuel wood out the back to propel it forward. But my point is this. We arrived here, we knew nothing. Greg and I bought a, I think, $600 car at the airport. Yes, we got, we, also we got uh, mattresses from the uh, street vendor. A street vendor, we got we our mattresses. At, <laughs> we slept on mattresses. <laughs> and we got vendor. one apartment that we shared, so we shared a car, a crappy, crappy car called an Isuzu Opal, a 1977 Isuzu Opal, and we shared the car, we shared an apartment, and then when we got to work, we sh our desks faced each other, and after two years, we were ready to kill one another. We were just <laughs> staring at each other constantly. If one of us had a date, the other one had to go. I, I, didn't, I didn't have dates. I was always woman. in the back seat. He was in the back seat of my dates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did just to just to you know give us a little credit. Uh, when we were hired, we were hired for a three-week contract, mm -hmm. and um, they kept uh, re-upping our contract in three-week increments. And we didn't buy the car until a couple of months in, where they gave us a nine-week contract, and we were like, yes, we have job security. We can afford to buy a That's car. That's true. <clears throat> And then when we went to Sound Out Live, we were on a three-week tryout. I thought it was a two-week tryout. Wasn't it the two-episode tryout? Two ep you're right. It was a two-episode tryout. I gave you an extra week to look good. And uh, <laughs> I told him at the time it was a three-week tryout. <laughs> Just because he was I was still hanging around the week after the show yeah. was in hiatus. So, um, yeah, I guess the... Uh, um, so we could have been drummed out after three weeks. They wouldn't have. They didn't take that big a financial risk on. That. No, and there were periods too where we were unemployed. I don't know what it was like for you, Al, but we had we had a period of time where, not necessarily the new shrank at staff. We didn't have jobs, and Greg was teaching SAT prep, and I wrote about this later in a speech I gave at Harvard. But I I uh, got a job at Wilson's House of Suede and Leather, um, <laughs> And I was the male secretary to a very attractive woman, and it was like the plot of any porno. Uh, <laughs> she wore short skirts and tall red boots, and she was real, and she'd come in, she'd be like, how you doing, you know? And I'd be like, I'm doing real good, you know? <laughs> and I'd be like, it's getting hot in here. And she'd say, no, it really isn't. It's not hot at all. You should leave your shirt on. But, There's a lot so, of ways to get ahead in this business. Exactly, That's yeah. only one of them. I could have risen to the top of Wilson's House of Suede and Leather. Um, but yeah, there was, uh, there was a lot of uh, trying different, I don't know, trying different things, and I knew I wanted to perform, but didn't know how to do it. Greg, I didn't even know that you were supposed to go get headshots, so Greg took headshots of me. I found them about six weeks ago. They're the worst photographs of anybody ever <laughs> taken. They look, I look like I've, uh, a terrorist that's been spotted at the airport, you know? I didn't want him to succeed. I, that he, would be the end of the team if he yeah. got his own TV show, so... <laughs> Now, we uh, are interested in... No, no, in we got this. We're okay, good. go ahead. <laughs> you, just, you just, you know, whatever, okay? Just kidding, go ahead. I'm just being a dick, because it's I was gonna. I, I was going to invite, because uh, I'm out of material, uh, and I was going to invite the audience to uh, start to question, and there must be a method for it, right? Someone's figured out that there are... Microphones, or maybe not, okay. I think it's a fairly uh, small room. I think yeah. if someone were to uh, stand and raise their hand, and if they were picked, they could probably speak loudly enough to be heard. Yeah, we could try that. <laughs> is there, is there That's a professional anybody talk. inspired yeah. yet? I'm sorry, I think raising one's voice is still... Yeah. There's okay, one. of Wade, course it's the good. guy way in the back. Let's try that. <laughs> That's fantastic.
I can just share, we did, um, Mike Reese and I did lectures for National Lampoon right at the start of our career. And uh, we had this intricate thing planned out and it went well. And um, it was supposed to go 50 minutes and it went 40. And then we said, now we'll take questions. And nobody had a question. And then we asked each other questions and there still weren't enough questions. And then <laughs> 45 minutes, we just said, well, we're leaving. And then they said, well, we're not paying. <laughs> so um, I hope you guys have more questions. <laughs> Conan, the question was about being underprepared for performance. Yes. Uh, for me, that would be 1993 to 1996, <laughs> approximately. <laughs> I uh, was someone who uh, I think was, uh, I was a comedy writer that uh, I, I think did well in the room when I was a Simpsons writer. And I was always performing and acting, performing bits. It's kind of a part of how I wrote. I would do it. If people around me laughed, uh, I would say, maybe we should write this down. Um, and then, so that had been a thing of mine, and I did a lot of improv on the side. It was the first, the first thing I did when I got to LA, after we got our apartment, was call the Groundlings. They didn't have a class available. I went and took a class uh, with uh, a woman named Cynthia Segetti on La Cienega at the Coronet Theater, a tiny little room, and I would tell people I'm doing improv and no one knew what I was talking about. They said, you mean stand-up? And I'd say, no, it's not stand-up and they thought I was making it up. And uh, my first day of class, I met someone else who was taking the class, who was really funny and great and sharp, had just graduated and come from the East, and it was Lisa Kudrow. So we made friends, and we were both like, someday we're gonna make it. <laughs> and um, that's how we spoke. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it was a disorder you I I remember, because I, I wasn't in the class, I've never done any, any performing, but Conan would bring these interesting friends by from his improv class, and uh, also in that class was uh, Cynthia Stevenson, yeah. uh, an actress who got an um, uh, early great role on The Player. She's in the movie The Player. The she player. plays the assistant. The, yeah. And I, I remember when she got that role, you guys were all sitting around, and I remember thinking, oh, that's too bad. That's the one who's going to get famous out of that class because there can't be more than one. Right. <laughs> right. There's only room for one person in show yeah. business. But no, but then, long story short, and it's too long to get into, but through a series of 900 improbable events um, that all had to happen perfectly, David Letterman left uh, NBC. They were in the lurch. They went to Lorne. Lorne looked, wasn't quite satisfied. And then he said, you know, there's this guy I know, and he's got something. He's got weird hair, but a weird name, but he could be funny. And NBC was desperate, and they threw me on the air, and I got the shit kicked out of me. I can say that, I think, because uh, we're all adults here. The dean just walked out. Um, <laughs> but uh, for about a year and a half, and had to learn how to do it on the air. And how long was your contract at the beginning? Wasn't it a short cycle thing they had you on? What a pleasant thing to bring up. Uh, <laughs> So glad I came, by the way. This is fantastic. Just talked about the time I was beaten in prison, too. Um, yeah, I, no, initially it was a longer contract, and then NBC decided we might not want to keep this guy. So uh, through a little bit of chicanery, they broke it. They had a guy come into my office one day and say, uh, you know that you're supposed to be renewed for nine months. We are changing that to 13-week renewals. And so they literally had an egg timer on my talk show desk that they would and I would see how I was doing every 13 weeks. And so I struggled through a few of those. You know, there's then, panels being renewed in 12 minute increments. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. We just passed there first. Exactly. <laughs> so it's so funny now because younger people just always think, talk about smooth sailing. From a distance, everything looks like smooth sailing. And now people just think that, uh, to, and a lot of people in this room, I've been on TV for most of their life and they just think it's all been smooth sailing and they don't know that there was a period of that was very real to me, where I, I constantly thought, you know, and it's happened more than once uh, that I'm done, even a couple of years ago. So you never know. It's, a, it's, a, it's an insane, speaking to your point, anybody, uh, insecurity drives every performer, and anybody who isn't nervous or a little bit insecure before they get up on stage is a bad performer. By the way, if actually, that. too, what you're saying, I think it applies to the Letterman show, I don't think that was a hit right from the start. Critically, I think people thought it was rough. You know, it, a lot of times things that people seem, you know, were inevitable after the fact. They don't think that they were the case at the beginning. Well, I, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, 
celebrities and say, remember Conan, I was on your show at the beginning. I was the one that believed in you. And if you go and you actually look at the records, they came two and a half years in <laughs> when I was, but now they come up to me and say, I always knew and remember when I came and no one else would and I did. <laughs> And I think, screw you, Martin Short, you know? Okay. I just did that for Marty, because he's such a nice guy. I saw Martin Short the other day, and he looked at me, and he said, Conan, whatever work you're... Ha he pointed at my face and said, whatever work you're having done, do 20% more than stop. <laughs> That's my advice. There's a question right over here. Has Lampoon's defunct, so good luck. Yeah, the Harvard, the Harvard Lampoon's still around, but the National Lampoon's uh, now like a chemical company or something. <laughs> well, Greg, I mean, it's different for, because they're different... Greg's shows, I mean, Greg would probably be the best one to answer that question because you do so many different, show, different shows that require a certain kind of specific writing. Yeah, I think it's a very um, sort of standard policy to read spec scripts when you're hiring writers for half-hour shows. Um, I'm sure yeah, you do we that do, too. We do too. Um, they're submitted by agents. I just don't read Simpsons because I don't want to see storylines that we, then we couldn't do. Yeah, and... Um, Sometimes, depending on what the show's about, you might say to the agents, and, and there's you know five agencies or so in town, and, and uh, they'll call. If you have jobs to give out, they call immediately, and they want to get their clients' work in front of you. And you might say, for example, when I did King of the Hill, I said, if you have anybody who's from Texas or has some kind of experience like that, um, you know, send them first, because I want to have some authentic stories you know, in the, in the show. Um, but aside from that, you're just reading the scripts. And the weird thing is that I have hired a lot of people from the Lampoon, but a lot of times I didn't know they were from the Lampoon, kind of to your point. Uh, but there's still perhaps a sensibility that I recognized and liked or something and of these people who were, you know, I never met before. But um, I, I also kind of think a lot of it is uh, if you don't have the opportunity to write uh, comedy in preparation for it, you can still hang out with funny friends and care about it and stop, you know, prevent yourselves from doing the easiest kind of jokes and um, you know just have try and uh, one of the things about the lampoon I think is that you you had to develop some standards because the other ones sneered at you when you did really easy jokes so I had yeah. the same experience as you guys were talking about which is reading something I really liked then later finding out it was a lampoon grad and going damn it I wanted you know a, a broader perspective I actually got uh, attitude from people when I went first time I went back to lampoon I didn't go back for a long time but I went out of my way not to hire lampoon people because I thought I have that sensibility so I mostly hired uh, Chicago people from the Chicago improv scene I hired uh, two people that were journalists I hired uh, Louis C.K., gave him his first job, uh, Dino Stamatopoulos, a bunch of people, Robert Smigel uh, had come from Saturday Night Live. And so I got a reputation for a while. People thought I was mad at the Lampoon, and it was just, I wasn't mad at them. I just wanted to, I wanted the show to have a different sensibility. And I was following the Letterman show that it had so many Lampoon people, I thought, well, I have to go a different way. And um, so, uh, we actually did the opposite. And now, what's happened is the internet's changed everything. We've just started, as Saturday Night Live is doing, we're starting to see people who've done really good work uh, on the internet. And that can be helpful sometimes, because you can see that they have a great eye. If you're doing a show like mine, that's a, a variety show that's on every night, and you see that someone is very good at not just writing, but they also have a good eye on how to shoot something, and how to assemble it, and how to create, how to cast it, it's a big plus, and we hired a guy recently, who, and he's turned out to be a huge hit for us. I was gonna say, we, we, we hired a woman um, recently based on her tweets, just her, just her Twitter feed. They didn't have any other um, writing samples. Yeah, and she didn't work out, because it was uh, just tweets. That's all she can write. <laughs> <clears throat> I've seen those episodes of Parks and Rec, and no, her name's, her they're name's terrible. Megan Amram. I only write her 140 characters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It always says hashtag in the line. Right yeah. there is a question. <laughs> a 
Well, in my case, it's uh, lucky that animation stays fresh a lot longer than any other form, I think. And, um, you know, you're doing a show about a family in the case of The Simpsons, and bad things are always happening to families. And, uh, you know, <laughs> why is that funny? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> times are tough. Uh, but uh, I think that just the nature of it, the number of characters, the versatility of the actors all, you know, help. I mean, not just The Simpsons, but shows like Family Guy, King of the Hill, stay on the air longer than any other genre. I'm also not always sure we keep the writers from fresh. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, I, I would just, that's a, it's, an, it's an ongoing problem. It's an ongoing, I wouldn't say a problem, but it's an ongoing concern, which is things getting stale, things work, you get into a rut, it's easy to just keep bringing it back, um, and uh, you need to... Uh, you need to do some, something to break out of that. And uh, so every now and then, I think every show experiences times, I know mine has, and I'm sure you guys have had it too, where you feel like, oh, uh, we're drifting, we're, it, it's the, we're, it, nothing's, nothing that exciting has happened in a while, and then uh, there's a lot of gnashing of teeth and, and uh, wringing of hands, and then suddenly m maybe there's some personnel changes, things seem to improve. Well, I remember when I was on The Tonight Show with Carson, there was a meeting at, we didn't know what it was about with Fred de Cordova. And we came in and he goes, Johnny says no more jokes about Pete Rose scratching his crotch. <laughs> like that was a big, you know, <laughs> memo from the top. Pete Rose was a that baseball That was nine player. references you guys don't know. Well, um, I, Carson, I'll... of course, is Carson Daly. <laughs> Pete Rose was a blogger at the time who was married to Khloe Kardashian. <laughs> I'm going to get this back on track, single-handedly. I just want, I want to say about, about the drift that happens on a writing staff, um, there's different kinds of writers even on a writing staff, and you try and put them together kind of like a baseball team being put together by a manager or something, and the, the ideal way for me to have a half-hour staff is to have people who are very good at story and character in the upper-level roles, and then the, the younger writers are the ones that, uh, for me, the way I run it, are, are the best at the jokes. And most of the time, in my experience, the writers who are really the best joke writers often don't have a respect for the contributions of the story people, but the story people can usually tell a great joke and are grateful to have it in. So I like to have them in the older, like, higher positions. But what happens is, as the show ages, the guys in the higher positions become too expensive and leave and try and do their own shows. The guys in the lower positions who were hired on their joke writing ability kind of rise through the ranks and become the, the higher paid senior people. And, and it kind of gets inverted. And I think that's why a lot of shows get broader and, um, as they go on. It's interesting. It's a, it's a definite problem all long running shows have where dumb characters get dumber, you know, slutty characters get sluttier. And, and, and you uh, have to, like, the person at the top is always supposed to say, no, don't do that breaking the character, but you kind of get worn down and you're trying to do something you haven't done before. And, and yeah, certainly it's a problem we've had. I remember when, when we were on The Simpsons, this is to, to, to mention Conan, um, The Simpsons was much more realistic in the very beginning. Um, I loved the early years that I wasn't on where Jeff was on and you were on and everything in Conan. And um, I got, got on to that show, uh, I guess, in like uh, season five. And they all pointed at the monorail episode that Conan had written as being, um, you know, the outlier in terms of unlikeliness and rule yeah. breaking. There was a big, when we first got there, I got a lecture that, because uh, I thought of, I, I liked, I was a joke guy and I liked weird concepts and I thought of myself as a hot shot. And so I, you know, I thought I'm, I'm coming to town and I'm going to, I'm going to blow everyone away with my weird concepts. I'm the fastest gun in the West. And they were all like, slow down. Slow down, pal. Uh, that's how we talk. I think, I, think I called you Maverick. Yeah. I said, <laughs> you said, hey, Maverick, and I had a toothpick in my mouth. And I was like, hey, man, I'd have to do it my way, and I rode a motorcycle. Um, I said, you have talent to burn. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, they, they went on and on and on about how it's a family. It's not a Warner Brothers cartoon where a character can blow up, you know, uh, we can, uh, you know, if Homer gets shot in the face with a shotgun, his face just doesn't turn, that was the example they gave, his face just doesn't turn black like Wile E. Coyote, and he gets mad, 
it would blow his head off. And, and so you have to work within those confines. And then there's leeway, obviously, because it's a cartoon, but it's very important to respect that. And then I uh, pitch this show where the town gets a monorail and um, it gets weirder and weirder and weirder. And then it ends with Leonard Nimoy saying, well, my work here is done. And he beams out. He actually <laughs> beams out and disappears. And then the end of the episode is everybody on an escalator going to nowhere that's uh, five miles high in the sky. This got made, and then later on, <laughs> I got... And what's funny is throughout the rest of my career, I've been on doing a late-night show for 20 years now, and I'll be walking along some city at night, and it's always some guy that looks like he's like wearing a fish T-shirt, and he's, <laughs> he'll come across the street and he'll be like, Conan, man, and he doesn't want to ask me anything about my late-night show or all the stuff I've done since, and he's like, monorail, man. <laughs> monorail, man. <laughs> And the thing is, then later on, I was told that I broke The Simpsons. <laughs> well, I, 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 so my thanks. first episode... Thanks again for bringing that up. No, it was great. My first episode was, um, <laughs> was uh, 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 one where uh, Homer gets Apu fired. And, um, and I, uh, you know, after the first draft, I was uh, told to, to rewrite it and have Homer go to India to get his job back. Um, and I, and I remember just going, we've established that Homer makes $200 a week. How is he going to afford this ticket to India? And this was this huge um, debate at he the He can time. go on a monorail, baby. Yeah, <laughs> didn't matter. Problem solved. <laughs> go ahead, right there. I think that's a really good point, which is the lampoon isn't a group of people who are related to each other that nepotistically get on. It's you're selected because you have to write funny things and other funny people judge them. So it, it is a group that's already sort of been pre-selected as, you know, funny comedy writers. And then, you know, the people that I met who were on the lampoon, they were the funniest people I'd met to that point in my life. I still work with many of them. But in that sense, it's probably no different than UCB or Second City or any mm -hmm. group of people who have been brought together from a shared interest in comedy and are hanging out a lot and uh, trying hard to write stuff or trying hard to perform stuff or whatever. And when you look at show business, I guess there's there's little pockets that have similar backgrounds. There's a ton of people from UCB. There's a ton of people from Northwestern. And USC, of course, has a ton of people. And Second City is probably the biggest credit you know, among show business. Yeah, Second I think City it's UCB Chicago, now. And UCB it? now is, I mean, when I was doing the late night show in New York, we used to use all the UCB people because we knew them and we were paying, essentially paying their rent. We were using Amy Poehler almost every week. We were using Jack McBrayer. We were using all these people who were completely unknown. And they now they come up to me and they say, from 1993 to 1999, you paid my rent in New York uh, by doing these, these, these little bits on the show. That probably that wouldn't be possible today because now they're all huge stars. You uh, have a lot of people that come up to you <laughs> for a celebrity. <laughs> I do attract, I suppose. Not a lady here that doesn't want to chat with me. Go ahead, right there. Or a dude. Oh, this guy. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that is a huge component that needed to be brought up because, um, you know, I, b before that I wanted to say, because I know this forum, it's very easy to look at the people here, people up here or Jeff Martin and say like, oh, M Lampoon people just, just, you know, there's a lot of Lampoon people who've uh, struggled and uh, people that have come from the Lampoon and, and not found the right niche in show business and it hasn't worked out. I think that should be, uh, this can be a little misleading. Um, and, and then the second thing is there is an incredible amount of stress and my life writing comedy, the years that Greg and I wrote together, we were scared and nervous a lot of the time that our job would end, and there was a lot of anxiety, and... Uh, you gave yourself shingles. I gave myself shingles in my eye. Um, I don't know if anyone here has had shingles, but it's a stress-induced, uh, usually, uh, virus, and I got it in my eye 
stumbled to Cedar sinai by myself, unattended, got into the, and they thought that I had been in a motorcycle accident because half my face was all, and it was just literally through the stress of us trying to... Uh, I don't know how The Simpsons, how you guys feel over The Simpsons now. I remember that when I was there personally, um, every night we stayed till 10 p.m., probably minimum, and... Um, uh, and people would always come up and say, God, it must be so much fun to, to write on The Simpsons. And, uh, and it was, at times, very fun, but they, I always uh, assumed it would be as fun as it was watching The Simpsons, uh, which takes, you know, like 40,000 hours of man hours and compressing it into 20 minutes. And There's, oh, yeah, the hours yeah. are still long. And, oh, I was just going to say one thing that have, I think has also made things tougher is now every episode is reviewed by everybody the day it comes out. And um, I know, like, the producers of Homeland, you know, they had a twist that they did in the fourth episode. I don't want to give it away. But the people, like, watching the first three were furious. This is terrible. And, like, you know, you go, well, wait, you know, something may be paying off. That doesn't happen in our show. Nothing pays off. But in Homeland, <laughs> I thought it was a legitimate, you know, complaint. Like, people there, review everything instantaneously. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really healthy to note that uh, it's a great job, but it's a job, and um, producing content every day. Their format obviously is very different from my format, but um, I've, uh, you know, after 20 years and 3,000 some hours of making television, I'm nervous about what are we going to do Monday? Uh, is it going to be good enough? Is it going to have a good flow? Uh, and I'm nervous until it's done. And I'm, I'm happy the minute it starts, but the minute it's over, I'm worried about the next day. And it's a terrible way to live. <laughs> I read Steven well, Spielberg you. says that that sick feeling in your stomach he always still gets, and that has been a key to why he's you know the most successful director ever. Yeah. We're going to come over to this section for the next question. I just want to offer one uh, comparison note to this point, uh, which is that, and I'm I guess that rare lampoon guy who. Uh, Went into has drama. some respect from uh, no, 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 no. people uh, outside of the entertainment industry. But, but I, I've worked on the drama side, and we on the drama side always looked over at the comedy. The only thing that could make us feel better about our jobs was looking at the comedy guys. <laughs> because they worked the longer, more difficult hours, and it was much more room dependent. And, uh, and so they, the, the drama side doesn't have uh, quite the same pressures. And, and the, th the things you're going for are not actually as difficult to achieve as a laugh, which is probably the single most difficult thing to achieve with typing. Let's, right there. In the, yeah, you, the striped shirt, yeah. Well, if you talk kind of funny. Accents, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you very much. I was going to There's leave another that question way up there. Go ahead. Another striped shirt. Wait, I think he had a real question. I think that was a real question. You're not picking him because he's from a foreign land? It seemed unanswerable, but you just wait. Conan has an answer. No, I have question. the answer, but I'll tell you after this panel. It's very simple. Who the hell are you? What? This whole thing is falling apart quickly. Listen to him, he's a brain scientist. I know him from the lab. And then another woman stands up with a baby, don't listen to either one. And he's like, they love you and leave you, what? <laughs> and he's like, dramatic. you must believe me, I'm president of Greece. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But what about me, I am a robot. <laughs> Where are you from, sir? Let's find out about you personally. Huh? Israel. You're from Israel. Oh, welcome, sir. <laughs> you and I have a lot in common. I, uh, the answer to your question is, it, uh, I believe anybody who makes their living doing comedy de developed this mechanism when they were like two or three years old. It's a defense mechanism. In my case, and I think I speak for some of the other people here, it's a hyper-developed defense mechanism. And there's no being 25 and saying, I've never cracked a joke in my life, but I think I'm going to start now. <laughs> this is all I had. You know, I couldn't fight. I had, no girls were interested. I couldn't sing. I couldn't play in it. This was all I had. And I developed it and developed it and developed it, and it's sad. <laughs> Gentlemen? <laughs> now he's going to implant that in everybody's brain with his surgery. <laughs> It's, yeah. 
with the help of his colleague. <laughs> you go over there and tell them that... Okay. Are you ready to guide us to the next stage of this discussion? Is there more? Why not just keep... Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, like anything else, desper desperation, we've got to fill things, people come up with stuff. The nice thing is that, the nicest thing I can say about comedy writing is that people tend to remember your best work. It's probably true of all artistic endeavors, but they remember your good stuff. And so, um, whenever uh, we just put together a, a whole bunch of clips from 20 years of work, and you look at it and you think, man, we always hit it out of the park. And then you think, there's another montage we could show. Yeah. <laughs> A much longer montage of things that uh, didn't work. And my writers insisted for a solid year that they had a character that they loved and they kept bringing it back called the Reverend Otis K. Dribbles. It was a priest wearing a dog mask, dribbling a ball while the Harlem Globetrotters theme played. And they made them laugh really hard and I kept saying, what's the joke? And they would say, the joke is there is no joke. And the I would say, then there is no paycheck. <laughs> 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 I would say, I'm not paying you. <laughs> and um, so there was plenty of things like that. So it's, it's a lot of trial and error, trial and error, trial, and it still is. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it still is. It's, Natural selection is, is an incredibly powerful uh, process that led to all of us being alive here. Unless, <laughs> Un unless. like I, you believe, <laughs> that we come from the rib of Adam. Well, at the risk of throwing out another Carson reference, there was a thing oh he used to God. do. Oh, my God. Let me tell Let's you, go Conan, there was a guy named Johnny Carson. Let's go further he, back. Why not? Yeah, no, but... Um, what about Kay Kaiser and his <laughs> band of renown? I've got spurs that jingle, jangle, jingle. <laughs> Audience filing out. Please, please let Rudy me... Rudy Valley, he was the best singer of the 20s, I tell you. <laughs> there was a sketch called The Edge of Wetness, where <laughs> we used to write it and we hated it. <laughs> and then we heard that Carson hated it and the audience hated it. So we never knew why we were doing it. <laughs> because every, every unit hated it. That was a product placement. Sounds like an early <laughs> arid, extra dry product placement. We've got a question right in the middle. Just, yeah, I actually thought this is a mixed blessing. Um, I was really looking forward to the period of my career where I could cruise, you know, just, I'm not, I'm not I'm being completely honest with you, the period where I could say, okay, we've got all these sketches that people like, and no one judges them anymore, and we just do them, and I was starting to think, they're getting, you know, God, I can't, I, I, how many year 2000s can I do? How many of these can I do? How many clutch cargos can I do? But people get excited every time we do it, and I thought, now I can just, like cruise control, I can put this thing at 60 miles an hour, um, you know, rope off the steering wheel and make myself a sandwich and go down the highway, <laughs> and, which I do uh, <laughs> when I go up the coast. And, um, and then I went through this thing, and, uh, and, and then suddenly we couldn't use any of that stuff. And I thought, well, this is actually good, because most people getting, I was at that point 16 years in, 16 and a half years in, and I could just cruise and not modify anything. And now and we've had to work really hard, and we've had to work extra hard to find new things, which someone maybe to be honest, my age probably wouldn't be working that hard to try and find. And I started to uh, try things just on a whim. I started reviewing video games and that, uh, because I don't play video games and I'm terrible at them, and I started reviewing them and we started taping it and then putting it out there and there's a huge gaming community and it became this whole thing that I never would have found if I had the luxury of just relying on the old material. So it's just hard. You just have to start over again and uh, hope for the best. Right there.
Yeah. Um, all right. Well, improv, there's a lot of improv, but it's not used so much for the generation of the text. It's more used as a tool to get a naturalistic acting out of the lines. And the way it is often done is the actors will take a stab at what the uh, pages are. They'll uh, have some trouble with it, quickly decide that it was written incompetently. Um, <laughs> You encourage them to uh, to put it in their own words and improvise it. They do that. They understand what the point of the scene is after putting it in their own words, um, and then uh, and then they realize, you know what? Actually, those jokes are kind of better than the ones that we're doing now. And they end up going back to the as written um, pages, but they play them better. That's how, that's what normally happens. And then there's little moments like modules that where the scenes over the point of the scene's been made. And then they then they throw out all different variants, and those will actually be used. Uh, I when, when I started Parks and Recreation, I had really sold the actors on how much improv we did because that was like a, a selling tool. And they showed up and they started to improvise things where like um, you know the scene was uh, you know uh, we got to go to the to this restaurant or something, and uh, and we had a restaurant set built or we had a location and we're gonna all get in trucks and move there. And then they would end the scene saying we're going to the zoo. And you go, well, yeah, that's not an acceptable improv to change, <laughs> you know, to change something which is the location for the rest of the script. So you, there is a sort of training process to figure out how do you, you know, what, what can be substituted with another noun or another something without changing the story. And that's what a lot of At it is. At The Simpsons, we just go to the zoo then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see, right there, the second row. Yeah, there's uh, Doug Kenny and Henry Beard, and maybe you mean Chris Cerf. Uh, Doug and Henry founded the National Lampoon, um, and uh, they wrote so many great things, including the high, high school yearbook parody, and uh, Doug co-wrote Animal House. Um, I, I think those guys were part of this real turning point in humor where, um, you know, comedy, is, I'm not the first to say this, but used to be like the comic going, I'm a schmuck, I'm stupid. And the National Lampoon style humor was, you're a schmuck, you're stupid. And it's really kind of transformed almost every, you know, comic, you know, thing that you see now. Um, and I, I can't say those are the only two guys that made that transition, but they were really instrumental. You know, I, I, when you mentioned Doug Kenny, um, I think he was the guy who changed the range of possible aspirations at the Lampoon. Pr prior to Doug Kenny, the Lampoon big dream, uh, for those who weren't going to go to law school or medical school, was the New Yorker. Uh, it, uh, Ian Frazier, Sandy Frazier, is, is the last one, I think, to kind of go from the Lampoon through that path. Uh, John Updike, those people. That, that's what it was. And then suddenly, Doug Kenny created this other vision of what was possible, especially uh, when Animal House came out, especially when the movie came out. Right there. Um, uh, who wrote that line, Conan? Which one of your <laughs> yeah of your staff? <laughs> That was improv, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that was improv I was very, very grateful for. But uh, I would, uh, I um, think the best advice that I got that still resonates with me, and I don't know how well he's known today, but when I was a senior on the Lampoon, I loved SCTV and we invited John Candy to the castle, and I just loved him as a performer, and I loved SCTV. And, um, and he came to the castle, and I got to be the one to take him around, and he was everything I wanted him to be. He was funny, generous, over the top. Um, I had been told he had a strict diet, that he was following a Pritikin diet, and he could only eat like various stewed vegetables, and he could have broth. I was given this long list by his assistant, and he showed up, and the first thing he did is he took me, he made me take him to a pastry shop. <laughs> 
and he started, he was this big, huge guy, and he started filling, having the guy fill it with eclairs. And I said to him, I was real nervous, I was, I don't know, 19, 20, and I said, Mr. Candy, what about the Pritikin diet? And he looked at me and he, don't worry, kid, they're Pritikin eclairs. <laughs> and I loved him. I absolutely loved him. And he told me, Later on in the night, and there was a lot of drinking and partying and, and at the Lampoon Castle and toasting John Candy. And then at one point, I told him, I'm interested in trying comedy. And he, you know, looked at me for a second. He said, it's not something you try. And I thought, it just, you know, you got to go all in. You don't, you, you, you just know that you have to do it. You absolutely know that you have to do it. And I think, for me, that meant... Uh, I remembered making the decision that if this was going to be something that never made me any money or got me any acclaim, it was something that gave me a lot of joy. It gave me a lot of, and that was my way in. And I think, uh, you know, some people look at it and as this is a good move, I could make, this is a good career to have. And for me, it just felt very much like this is something I, I, I have to do. And speaking of the other people I'm up here on the panel with, and, and with, with uh, Jeff Martin as well, it's just like, I know these people, and I think this is, yeah. <laughs> Every time he hears his name. Um, but uh, there are people who I can't imagine doing something else. I mean, Greg is meant to be doing what he's doing, and Al's doing what he should be doing, and Jeff's doing what he should be. Like, these are people that are funny in their DNA. They're this is what they're supposed to be doing. And so, to me, it's finding out for yourself the truth. Is this really what you should be doing? Is this something that you need to do? And uh, as opposed, uh, and I think that's very important. You know, if I, uh, that was anyway the most important component to me, the most important advice that I got. Yeah, I don't have any specific words from a specific person, but at The Simpsons, Jim Brooks, you know, is always known for just these shows. I was going to use Jim Brooks, damn it. <laughs> where um, Mary Tyler Moore, these things that, you know, people know of not just as funny, but as life. And, um, you know, he would always say it's an animated show, but you have to believe they're real characters. You have to believe Homer loves Marge. And I think, you know, that's not, you know, we, maybe we haven't always been true to it, but that's infused all our best moments. And anything that's, <clears throat> you know, uh, something that you relate to, the Honeymooners, for example, you would just go, that's because you love that guy. You, you know, it's just that he's funny. You just go, that's a real, true, you know, sad guy from Brooklyn. Um, uh, whatever. That's okay. No, I, I was going to say, to answer the question that was posed to all three of us, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that there's a number of people that... Um, that I, I've gotten good craft advice from, but um, actually not that many uh, that are sort of like encouraging us like to choose the whole, you know, career. But um, I would have to say it would be Conan because uh, when we started, I don't think I would have had the confidence to really pursue this. And Conan also always, um, uh, in, in one sense, took your, Conan always took himself very seriously in the sense that he wouldn't do crap jobs. Do you remember? Uh, like, there was time when I we will were, now, but at the time, <laughs> I had high well, standards. We were, we were really trying to get into it, and people yeah. would give us these horrible scraps that, you know, you couldn't really make anything funny out of. And I would be like, yeah, great, okay, we're now we're, you know, now we're going to, uh, you know, write for this clown uh, show or whatever. And, and Cohen would say, no, 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 we got to hold out for something really good where we can learn. And well, That's nice. No, I did, I did always have a really, uh, I, I there was a big thing where I just, I didn't want us, myself or Greg, working on uh, a sitcom, you know, like, you know what I mean? Even when we were, star not starving, but when we didn't have any money or any prospects, if someone had come along and said, there's kind of a crappy sitcom, you know, about a kid called Silver Spoons and you can write on it. <laughs> I didn't mean to impugn Silver Spoons. I realized I just did that. Um, but fortunately, no one here knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> But like Greg, his dream was to worry on uh, Knight Rider uh, with David Hasselhoff. <laughs> Again, a reference none of you are getting, so I'm going to move on. I'm going to move forward in time until I find a reference that you all like. Well, we Saved by the Bell. Fun. Saved by the Bell was a show. Are we getting warm? Are we getting closer? That was a show Greg believed in. Moving on later. There's a show called Jesse that's on Disney right now that Greg very much wanted to write for when she was... 
10 years before her conception. And I said, no, we can't do that. She's not born yet and has not, she's not even a zygote. This is stupid. Not a lot of zygote references on the non-lampoon panels, I'll bet. Exactly, thank you. Well, let me know when you think the panel's ready for the next question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, We're done. suddenly thank someone's you. touchy. Sorry. Just make right. sure they're from America. Right there. <laughs> Can't uh, have these Israelis bullying their way in. Though, you have to show proof yeah. of citizenship before you can ask a question. Because this is all about the USA. I'm kidding. Did you just put your arm down because you're not from this country? No. Seriously, did I just intimidate you? That's sad. Oh, you're from Brookline. Wow. I, you know, I, it's, uh, my involvement with that show is I really love Rebel Wilson. I had a meeting with her, and I've uh, had very little to do with the day-to-day -day on that show. I don't want to misrepresent how involved I am. I really love Rebel, and I think she's an amazing performer, and I think she has a great idea for a show and I think they're figuring it out, but other than giving notes here and there, I'm, I, I don't think there's too much. I think if I said too much about my role in that show, I'd be misrepresenting it. Sorry. Right up there. Yes, you. Yeah, I would say as we had previously, previously discussed a little bit that um, in, in National Lampoon too, it was just that um, if you trust us, you're an idiot. And um, th this is like, you know, say what Bill Murray's attitude seems to be like, you know, in you know movies that he does or, uh, I mean, it's like now so much a part of, you know, comedy culture, it's almost like second nature. But if you look at, say, a Bob Hope movie, it really doesn't have that same attitude. and. Um, uh, again, I think Doug Kenny and those guys were the ones that really helped make this turn. I think it was partly infused by the '60s and the, you know, the whole disrespect that the country, you know, got for its institutions and, uh, you know, turning it. Another guy I would say, um, not from Harvard, but Michael O'Donohue was one of the, the first writers that really expressed it. He did this thing, the Vietnamese Baby Book, which was this baby book where, um, you know, the to talk about the kid's first flesh wound, and then you know it ends with the kid dying. And, you know it was horrific, but it was you know true, and and it it uh, you know was one of like these you know touchstone pieces of the new comedy. Uh, maybe unrelatable humor. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's I think there's different styles of um, of uh, lampoon writers. In my experience with the different styles of lampoon writers, uh, you guys can all say if you think this is true. I think there's like the dark and the light writers on the lampoon. The dark ones are, are, can be very cynical and, and uh, weird, and the, the light ones are more jolly. Um, but uh, but uh, if there's anything maybe that combines it, it's maybe more conceptual stuff, like it's uh, a, a, an enjoyment for um, you know, weird ideas, uh, more than relatable human emotions. And I think the biggest thing, though, too, is something that Greg touched on earlier, and I think that Al has touched on, too, but I don't think you can stress it enough. The Lampoon, to me, is not that different. Uh, it, it's not that there's a sensibility there that's so much different than a sensibility that you'd find here at USC or that you'd find, uh, you know, um, well, there's no sensibility at UCLA. Those guys <laughs> blow, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, I'm running for Congress in a few years. The... Um, I would say the most important thing that I got from The Lampoon and that all of us got was that it got me thinking seriously about comedy and writing it, thinking about it every day when I was 18 years old. That to me is the thing, people can talk about what's the, what does the name mean, what does the pedigree mean, what is the, you know, is there a secret handshake that gets you in the back door, is there a certain style that you learn, is there a trick you learn? I got on as a first semester freshman, I was 18, and I felt like I had been, my eyes had been opened for the first time. I had always been interested in comedy, but now I had an organization, and when you're 18, a senior is 21, that's a gap, they, they a 21 year old seems like, you know, it might as well be a 50 year old, they're just so much, they're grown adults. <laughs> Great school. Uh, <laughs> 
they're, gr they're grown adults and they're taking comedy seriously and some of them are going on and, uh, to, to work in it professionally. That was the big difference is that by the time I graduated, and I think it's true of all of us, we had spent a lot of time writing comedy, thinking about it, what's funny, what's not funny, and you're in with a group of really sharp people who are kicking the crap out of you when it's not funny and writing really mean things and saying mean things to you when it's not funny. It's not a, uh, there's no, no one's pulling punches. So I think, if anything, it's Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hours, that that's, you gotta get your 10,000 hours. I think that is absolutely uh, true when it comes to comedy. I think if you can, if you're interested in it and you have a facility for it, the earlier you can start and the more you can do it. And I've, yes, people always come up to me, Al. Um, <laughs> It's a certain odor I have. <laughs> if they didn't yeah. before, they're going to now. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> incredible. Um, but, the, but I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, I want to be a comedy writer. I, it's, it's my passion. And I'll say, well, what have you written? Uh, nothing yet, but I want to. And I'm always impressed when someone says, I've done this, 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 this. Even if they're still serving coffee somewhere, they have a body of work. So... Start building your body of work. If this is what you want to do, start doing it. If you're not getting paid, it doesn't matter. Have a body of work. All the great novelists, when their first novel finally sold, they had six more in a drawer. Not the Fifty Shades of Grey person, but... <laughs> I think that was right off the bat. You know, I just I wanted to throw in one more source, too, that I think influenced the Lampoon a huge amount, was Monty Python and a lot of the say absurdist bits on Letterman, like what does something look like when you throw it off a building? Like Monty Python was the originator, at least to me, of all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's go way in the back there. Yes, right there. <laughs> well, I didn't find out till later, but my whole loss of The Tonight Show turned out was a prank. <laughs> Thought up by this guy, which I now think is very funny, by the way. I don't know how you pulled that off. Well, John Bowman, who introduced the panel, a professor here, when he was a kid, he used to call his dad on April Fool's and leave a message saying, Mr. Fox called with the number of the zoo. So I still do that to John every year. Classic. <laughs> I think that's actually, a, a, I mean, not a very hard to recreate thing, but is one of the real um, more, you know, striking things about the Lampoon is that it, it was founded by William Randolph Hearst, right? Is yeah, it? it's subsidized by him and... Um, there was an architect, Edwin March Realwright, who designed this incredible building in Boston that's... And you wouldn't believe that it is existing in the modern world, and it's got, it's filled with weird, cracked art that people have, you know, broken. It, it is a it Flemish and... castle in the middle of, on Bow Street, in the middle of Cambridge, that um, the Lampoon did a really smart thing, which was they, they took a young man named William Randolph Hearst and put him on the business board of the Lampoon. And then later he said, I think we should have a building. <laughs> now to most College Humor magazines, that means we get to use a corner of the basement. And William Randolph Hearst said, it should be a Flemish castle. <laughs> Filled with antiquities, make it so. And then I have to say, I agree with, I mean, with Greg, that organizes your attention. When you're 18 years old and you're excited to get to walk into a 7-Eleven alone and you go into, a, 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 you're invited to join a bunch of people at a Flemish castle, you start to take shit seriously. And we, I think we, I think it was very, it, I think it got my, it certainly got my attention. Except we never cleaned it. <laughs> no, it always it smelled. It was a horrible mess and our parents would come and they'd go, you're in a Flemish castle and you can't take care of it. <laughs> Well, also the year, uh, the time when I was president, when you're supposed to be in charge of it, I was spent the whole time I was terrified because there's, the, there's Delft tile on the walls, which is like a museum quality Delft tile on the walls. And 
there's no guard, there's no, people are throwing beer bottles against the wall and smashing, you know, they'll be like, this vase once was owned by Jesus and someone's <laughs> smoking a bong, uh, you know. It, I don't know, I just, I, I was terrified the whole time that yeah. the thing was gonna catch fire or something terrible was gonna happen and I'd be arrested, so yeah, it was. I wonder if there is something to that though, like, like there's, there was definitely a feeling of, um, squandering or something or abundance or something that was relaxing and maybe that's like on some level for creativity i'm gonna get you know weird and spiritual or something but maybe there there is uh you maybe you do need to feel like oh there's there's plenty of extra jokes there's plenty of extra stuff you know you're not too like uh, this one thing has to work or something okay i ruined the whole panel sorry go ahead <laughs> yep <laughs> yes. Yeah, so he's referring to this guy, Jordan, who's on our show, and it's happened naturally, but he's sort of a dead-eyed... Um, uh, he's a douchebag. He's a, <laughs> sorry. It's the only word that perfectly ex explains him. He is a guy who I like, and I think he understands he is that guy, and he's also putting a little English on the ball, if that makes sense. Like, he is that guy, but then he's adding 20%. But it just works, and any time, and so now we've gotten to the point on the show where I find out for real that Jordan comes in four hours late, and so we set up cameras and catch him coming in four hours late, and then I confront him in his office, and he's totally unfazed. He'll walk in, there's a whole camera crew, I'm like, Jordan, you're four hours late, and we've been videotaping you, and everyone on the staff hates you, and he'll say, it is uh, not my concern what others think of me. Uh. <laughs> And I'll say, what is, your, what is your job here at the show? And he'll say, I can neither confirm nor deny what it is I do. And it's funny, because I actually don't know what he does. <laughs> and he's an employee, and we keep catching him doing things. He bought an espresso machine with my money <laughs> for the office, but it's outside his office and nobody else's office, and only he knows how to use it, and no one else is allowed to use it. And I catch him, he's like, it's here for all to use. And I'm like... No one can find it. That is not my concern. So when you read Daily Variety tomorrow, the headline is Conan at USC, Slansky a douchebag. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, to, your, to the point being that's something where we've been forced to find, we've been forced, we've been forced to find, uh, you know, um, just because of, we may never have found Jordan Slansky if, uh, and, and, and elevated him to these heights of douchebaggery if we weren't forced to because we couldn't use all this other material. Go ahead. We have time for a couple more. Yeah, right there. Guys, were any of you involved in the production of the radio hour and records? Are you talking about National Lampoon? Yeah. No, I just loved them. No. I, I thought they were brilliant. Yeah. I don't think I that was That was a quick one. Yet. Good. Right, right over there. I'm uh, having all the workshops and stuff, I'm wondering if any of you had a favorite episode. Like, you know, it, I like everything but the monorail. <laughs> Pretty much There's one fish fan out there Who's with me I'm stunned I'm stunned by how many Simpsons questions I can't answer Because it's been so long And you know I mean Al can answer them all Because he's been there for so long But people know that I work there And they come up and they say Quick what's the nine You know what's, Who's the ninth guy sitting at the bar In the Flip flab jub jub episode, and I don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I just made that up, so that shouldn't make sense. Greg, do you have a favorite Simpsons episode? Uh, he, come on, he scored with the joke. Let's oh, move okay. on. Okay. <laughs> don't make right me. there. Go ahead. It's very hard to explain to people now what it was like in a pre-internet era. Well, you internet guys, you did the so Happy, Happy Good the Show. You want to tell them yeah. about that? Um, well, that's an example is uh, when I was, I had just gotten to Saturday Night Live with Greg, and I was really interested in performing when the show went into a writer's strike. And uh, the, the, there was a writer's strike, and the show was shut down. Didn't know what to do, and Robert Smigel and Bob Odenkirk, uh, now of Breaking Bad fame, invited me to join them and perform 
weird sketches, some of which were written by, by Greg and I, uh, in Chicago in like a little th rehearsal space, uh, a little, a Victory Gardens theater. So I went and, and did that. And in a pre-internet age, I mean, I just, all I have now left of it is someone made a really bad VHS videotape of it that uh, looks like a speech by Truman or something. It's just <laughs> awful looking. Um, and I have a pamphlet and that's all, I, and uh, so it's really stunning, you know, the difference now. The, all the work we had to do and the, I mean, the, everything we had to do and, and now it would have been internet videos, it would have been viral videos, it would have been vines, it would have been, you know, stuff that we posted on a, a you know, got on Funny or Die. Um, back then, I, it, it really does feel like we're talking about a hundred years ago, because I think that much has changed. But, but well, scripts, yeah. you, could, you have scripts, like I have scripts of things. There was some AFI contest for pilots in the 80s, and yeah. I have a pilot that I wrote for that. And, but it was almost impossible to get anything made without getting lucky and getting funding. Well, I was a writer before word processing and before Google, and I think those are the two biggest changes because they used to edit scripts where you'd cut and paste and send them to a typist. And you had research libraries if you wanted to know who the you know fifth king of England was. And when we were at Saturday Night Live, when Greg and I were at Saturday Night Live, there was a. I mean, it was out of Mad Men. I mean, we were there in the in the late '80s. So, but it's. It, I didn't accept it now. I mean, I, I didn't think anything of it now. Now it seems absurd to me. Greg and I would write scripts on yellow legal pads and then take them to a bunch of women in a typing pool. And it was, you know, then I just, uh, you know, and, and, would, and then later they'd come back to us and say, what's this word here? And I'd say, it's shellacked, Betsy, now get back there, you know? And I'd be drinking a highball and... You had two wives back then. I had two wives back then and I had a terrible drinking problem. And uh, Greg's hair was slicked back, he was the draper. Um, but anyway, it was just, it, you tell me that now and it just sounds insane that we... There was a typing pool. What do you mean it was a typing pool? But that wasn't common in the '80s. I mean, that I think whatever a show starts in the SNL started in '75. They probably kept whatever system they had. But I remember in, when we our first job, the big thing was an IBM Selectric. Yeah. And we got desks with IBM Selectrics, and we were like, "Yes, this is so this high is tech. the future." But also, yeah, there was a big generational divide between. You know, I remember when Greg and I got into comedy, and I think it's true of this our generation in general. There was a big generational divide between the 1960s comedies writers. They were counterculture. They were the guys that wrote on the early Saturday Night Live, or they wrote, they were writing in the late 60s, or they were writing for the Groove Tube, and they were writing in the early 70s, and they were always wanting to go up to their office and smoke pot. And, you know. Complaining about and, Nixon. There's a lot of complaining about Nixon. Yeah, they, would still, they were still complaining about Nixon, and he had been, you know, he's like going to be dead in two years, and he'd been at it. But they would, had bottles of liquor in their desk sometimes, and they'd light up a joint, and they'd, talk about you know, how much they hated Reagan and they'd go on and on and on and Greg and I would be like, well, let's go get bran muffins, you know? <laughs> Gotta watch the old cholesterol. <laughs> Eight hours of sleep or you won't have good ideas. <laughs> Hiya, chums, you know? And uh, it was this sharp divide. Like, we never did drugs. We didn't abuse liquor. We were just real like, we gotta do a good job. <laughs> All right, one more. Go ahead, you've been waiting. Yeah, with the, we have a table read with the cast, and um, uh, everything is, uh, you know, you see if it's funny, you see if it works emotionally, Jim Brooks and Matt Groening give notes on everything, and um, that's not far from the only time that we test it, then we rescreen it after we've recorded it. Uh, I think with comedy, like, people go, oh, that's a funny joke, and then it doesn't get a laugh, and they go, then it's not a funny joke. But eventually everything is tested using that machine. <laughs> that's the final step of the process. Is we consult your friend and then we get our, our databases and then we can move on. We, there's no, I mean, that's the big uh, question is what's funny and some things are, are funny for a moment and then they're not funny and some movies were hilariously funny to everybody in 1965 and you look at them now and no, they're awful. Uh, and then maybe they become funny again. No, it's impossible. It's impossible to know. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but because I do it every day, I'm testing things until the very last second. 
And um, before he was on the office, John Krasinski was one of our interns, and his job used to be to stand backstage and be the last person to see me before I went out the door, but went through the curtain to tell the jokes. And this was, I think, this is like in 2002 or something. And he was this really nice, you know, tall, skinny, good looking guy named John Krasinski, who was just an intern on our show. And I remember he was back there and I'm running through the jokes and I got to the last joke and I wasn't sure about it. And I said, what do you think about that joke? And like the band's playing and John Krasinski was really scared. He just kind of looked at me and he went, I think it's pretty good. <laughs> and he did that. And I, because I'm, I'm, I knew to kid, I could kid around with him, but I grabbed him by the shirt, shoved him up against the wall and said, what the hell do you know? <laughs> And then my music, and I walked right out through the curtain. But I, he'll still talk to me about that. He'll still say, I'll never forget the time. <laughs> I shoved him really hard. But that's a silly story to illustrate that you never know. Up until the last second, you never, ever know. You just don't. So you tell that scientist pal of yours. What was, what, what did, he, did he actually come up with a system? And it works. It's Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Kimmel 9000. All right, well, let, let's wrap it up with uh, final comments from the panel, uh, beginning with Al. Anything that you've, uh, you'd like to share that you haven't squeezed into this talk fest so far, perhaps words of encouragement? for the young people out yeah, there. Yeah, just to reiterate, seriously, that the, if you wanted to get into writing, the best way is to write uh, you know, a sample script, write something you love, and send it to Greg. <laughs> Greg? Uh, <laughs> I had this thing, I had a nice laugh on the Kimmel. Couldn't you just end there? Why are you obsessed <laughs> okay. with ending on a laugh, Greg? I don't know, man. These kids are here to learn. <laughs> And you're making it all about your exit line. Uh. That's so UCLA of you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Call back. Yay! It would have been the perfect time to get out. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. But there was, I, I walked away and realized there's nowhere to go. <laughs> Just Comedy classic. is easy. Beating Oregon is hard. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Just be kind. Man, now you, we were out. Now it's up for Greg to bring us home with his big laugh. <laughs> Just want everybody to remember to be kind and try hard. Oh, what an ass. Mr. O'Brien, your final comment. Well, it's funny. Puts me in mind of something Scott Bayo once said. I'm obsessed with one reference that this crowd will get. What was the big sitcom when you were, what was the big thing when you were 14? Friends. What? Friends. 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 The Office. Oh, that's nice. Charles in Charge? Okay, just curious. I just want to know who you kids are. Damn, microphone. Oh, we're, I don't have... What's that? We're just trailing off now. Yeah. It's just... <laughs> don't worry, Greg. I'll get us out on the big one. <laughs> I'll tell you something, gang. Free ice cream for everybody. Look under your seats. <laughs> Not one person. <laughs> it's been there two hours. It's all melted. Uh, I just agree with what they said. Work hard. Work really hard. Work harder than you think you have to work. Uh, and, and do it if you really love it, and you'll know. That's, that's all there is. There's no lampoon, not lampoon. <laughs> that's how powerful what I just said is. It interrupted the electric flow of this building. Go Trojans! Hooray for your school! Boo to the other school. Go internet. Come on, I'm trying to get us all on board with one last thing. I thought you did it about four jokes ago, but go on. I'm not good. Why don't you tell us another Bob Hope story? Come on, Grandpa. 
these kids want to hear. Let me tell you about a phonograph record I once made. I've got a wax cylinder I want to play for all of you. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece as white as snow. <laughs> Listen, Red, we had a thing called vaudeville, and they were funny back then. <laughs> Man, we're getting old in front of your eyes. Isn't it funny slash sad? All right. I think we're done here. Before those lights fade again, let's hear it for Thank Al you, Jeff Gene, Martin. Greg Daniels, and Conan O'Brien. <laughs> 